Story number one. In the late 1990s to early 2000s, there were a lot of mon gangs in Fresno, Merced, Stockton, and Sacramento. There were many shootings and killings at that time. I was in my early college years, taking an anatomy class that studied human parts. I had a friend named Rena, whom I secretly liked for a long time, but she was into bad boys. I remember the day when Rena's boyfriend was killed in a drive-by shooting. According to rumors, her boyfriend and his friends were sitting on a stairway in one of those two-story apartment buildings when the shooting happened. Rena's boyfriend was shot twice, once in the leg and once in the chest. He died before the ambulance arrived. Rena and I were very good friends, so during the funeral, she was very emotional and cried a lot. She asked me to go to the funeral with her. However, we were concerned that her boyfriend's family might think that she's already dating me. We didn't want Rena's boyfriend's family to think that Rena was cheating on him while he was still alive. So we had another friend, MK, go with us. When we looked at her boyfriend in the coffin, Rena was crying so much. They had these couple rings they had bought. Rena had her ring on her finger, and she placed her hand next to her boyfriend's hand, which had the matching ring. Rena was crying so much that her boyfriend's sister came and took her aside to comfort her. Rena's boyfriend's family were Christian, so the funeral wasn't creepy like in traditional Hmong funeral. While I was watching Rena talking to the sister, I noticed that her boyfriend's finger twitched a little. I got a bit scared and left to sit down with our friend. A few days later, in my anatomy class, we studied human muscles. At our college, there was a room with real human bodies that you could study. There was one body that had been skinned, so you could see the muscles. A lot of students from the anatomy class had been going there to look and study the muscles, so I decided to go too. One night, it was just me and another guy studying the muscles. After a while, he left, so I was alone. I wasn't scared because a lady was working at the front desk in the building. While studying the body on the table, I noticed something under its hand. I lifted the hand and saw a ring that looked like Rena's. I looked closer and there was no mistaking it. The ring had an R on it, Rena's initial. It was so weird. As I was taking my notes, I heard someone walking in the hallway, but the walking sounded strange, like someone dragging one of their legs. The sound stopped at the door. I got a bit scared and went out to look, but there was no one in the hallway. I just grabbed my stuff, left the building, and took the ring with me. I knew the body on the table wasn't Rena's boyfriend, because it was a non-Mong person. But I took the ring to Rena and told her about it. We started talking about how strange it was because even Rena confirmed that the ring was the one on her boyfriend's finger. We talked about it and I joked with Rena that maybe her boyfriend wanted us to get married. We laughed and had so much to talk about. After that, we started dating and eventually got married. But our marriage was bumpy. Things got worse when Rena went to work at a place with her ex-boyfriend's sister. That's when her boyfriend's sister told her that they thought Rena took the ring during the funeral, because after Rena visited, the ring was gone. Rena never took the ring, so she knew I took it and lied to her about it. After Rena and I got divorced, she posted about this on her Facebook to shame me. I went into hiding for a while, but then I thought I shouldn't live my life feeling guilty, so I decided to share my story. Desperate people do desperate things like I did. I did stole the ring at the funeral, then made up the story about the cadaver and how I took the ring from it. You shouldn't steal things from the dead. What happened to me was that once Rena and I got married and had three kids together, I started having leg pain, and there were days when I felt like I couldn't breathe. I went to the doctor, but they were never able to find what was wrong with me. I did some tests, and it was costly. However, once Rena and I got divorced, I no longer had those health problems. 
Therefore, I concluded that because I took the ring, I was cursed by it, as Rena's boyfriend was shot in the leg and chest. During our marriage, I kept having leg and chest pain. Do not steal from the dead. Story number two. I am a fisherman, and I love driving in the countryside. Here in Minnesota, we have so many lakes that you can go anywhere. I remember back in 2002 when I had just gotten my driver's license. Often, when I wasn't working and my friends were all in college, I would drive around to go fishing alone. There's this dirt road called Timber Lake Road. I'm not sure how things are nowadays in that area since I've moved to Virginia after my wife and I got married. Anyway, I remember Timberlake Road had a lot of mid-sized lakes along it. You could basically drive to one lake or pond, fish there for a bit, and if you spooked the fish, you could drive down to another lake. One evening, as the sun began to set, I thought to myself that since no fish were biting in the pond where I was fishing, I would make one last stop at another lake. I got in my car and started driving. About five minutes down the road, I saw a lady on the side of the road jumping up and down, with her hands in a pleading position. I knew not to stop, but for some reason, something told me that I should stop because she really needed help. I stopped, rolled down my window halfway, and asked her how I could help. She said there was a car down there, and she could hear a baby crying. She asked if I could go help because the car was smashed and she didn't know what to do. Before I know it, I went down with her through the tall grass and some bushes. I saw a dark green car and could hear a faint crying of a child. I got to the car, and that lady was behind me. I looked inside the car and saw that the baby in the car seat seemed okay. But the mother was dead with dried blood on her face. She must have been dead for a few hours for the blood to be dry. I told the lady that she could have gotten the baby out. Because the side where the baby was sitting in a car seat was okay, even though it was mildly damaged. I opened the door, got the baby and car seat out, and turned around. The lady was gone. The place was just silent. I looked around and started calling for her, but she was nowhere to be seen. I got scared, so I carried the baby in the car seat back up. It was a dirt road, and I didn't think many cars would be passing by. I put the baby in my car and drove to a house alongside the road and asked for help. When the ambulance and fire truck got to the site, the mother was already long dead. However, when they assessed the baby, they said the baby would be okay, just dehydrated. They took the baby to the hospital. To this day, I still have no idea who that lady on the side of the road was. Was it the mother's soul? I don't know if the lady looked like the mother or not, because the mother was all bloody, and I couldn't tell. But that happened on Timberlake Road in Minnesota. It's more of a countryside town, so I don't think many people know where it's at. But thank you for listening to my story. Story number three. I remember back in 2018 or 2019 when Lily Vang won the Hmong pageant competition and some unknown guy named Chung from France made a video mocking Lily and the Hmong American community for choosing a fat girl to win the competition, saying we are nothing compared to the fit girls in Laos. My sister, Nancy, was a strong supporter of the body positivity movement, believing that fat is beautiful and that you can be healthy at any size. I remember how vocal my sister was about the whole situation. Nancy was only 5'2 and weighed 268 pounds, so she was a very large lady for her size. Relatives would always compare Nancy to me because I'm thin, constantly saying things like, how come the younger sister is so beautiful and the older sister is so big and doesn't take care of herself? I guess her bitterness stemmed from these comments. Everyone including her doctor, always told her that she needed to lose weight or she was going to die young. The thing is, Nancy was a sickly person who was always going to the doctor, 
but any time a doctor told her that she needed to lose weight, she would just change doctors and then go online to write a bad review about that doctor's office for shaming her. Nancy's comments would get so many likes. One day I brought it up to her that she wasn't healthy and that she needed to eat healthily and exercise. We got into a big argument and I ended up apologizing to her for talking down to her. However, once she turned 31, one day she said she couldn't breathe. We thought it was her asthma as usual, but she said she had taken her inhaler and it didn't help. So she was rushed to the hospital where they put her on life support. She later died of a heart attack. I don't know why, but from the day she died to when we held her funeral a week later, when I went to sleep, I would hear her crying to me. I could hear her cry, and my mind would be awake, but I couldn't move my body. I could hear her crying and sobbing, apologizing to me for not listening and taking better care of herself. We held her funeral for three days and buried her on Monday. I was off work for two weeks, so I didn't have to go in. On Tuesday morning, I heard something knocking at my window. I sleep on the second floor, so I thought that was strange. But it wasn't like a human knock. It was like a little rock hitting my window a few times. It was a sunny morning, so I went to look. And as I opened the curtain, it was a hummingbird. I have some fake flowers inside at my window, and I guess it was trying to get to them. I thought it was so cute. I watched it for a good ten seconds before it flew away. When I was cleaning Nancy's room with my mother, I saw her diary. On the cover was a hummingbird and some flowers. I started sobbing, and my mother asked me what happened. I said I was just sad. I started reading her diary, and on the date when she and I were arguing, she wrote that she wished she could be as pretty as me, but felt trapped in a body she couldn't get out of. I remember one line in her diary, she wrote, I felt like a hummingbird trying to get to the flower inside a window. I started sobbing. Her window and mine have fake flowers on the inside. She must have saw hummingbirds trying to get in a few times. In some entries, she wrote that she couldn't sleep, even at 3 a.m. She couldn't sleep because she was so hungry, but she needed to lose weight. I just broke down, realizing I couldn't see the struggles my sister was going through. I felt so lonely and depressed after knowing some of the struggles that Nancy was putting herself through. This is just a short story of my sister that I wanted to share with you. Thank you for listening, and I hope you don't judge me. Story number four. We used to live in an apartment complex back in the late 1990s. During that time, many Hmong people were still very poor. So we all lived together like we did back in the refugee camp of Ban Vinai. There was a kid around 10 years old named Fong who would go around on his bicycle. His older brothers were gangsters, so even though Fong was mean to other kids, the parents couldn't really do anything. Fong would ride his bike around, and if he saw other kids playing with toys and their parents weren't around, he would take the toys from the smaller kids. Sometimes Fong's parents would make him bring the toy back and apologize, but even they didn't watch him properly and just let him go around causing trouble. I have two sons around the same age who were starting to become friends with this naughty kid Fong. I started lecturing them because sometimes I would see toys that I knew I didn't buy for them and it turned out they had stolen them from Kmart. I remember one night when I was coming home late around 11 p.m. I got to the neighborhood and saw a kid lying in the middle of the road. His bike was blocking the other side, and he was lying on my side, blocking my way. I honked at him, but he just lay there and then turned his head to smile at me. It was Fong. I got out of my car, and then he got scared, so he got up quickly, grabbed his bike, and took off. The next day, he came to play with my two kids outside. I asked him if it was him lying in the street last night, and he said it wasn't. I didn't say anything, but I knew it was him. He was probably lying. A week later, Fong was hit by a car in the same spot 
while he was crossing the street with his bike. The car took off, leaving him dead in the middle of the road with his bike. Nowadays, when I think about this incident, I wonder if Fong was telling the truth that the kid in the middle of the road that night wasn't him. Maybe it was something else. It's so strange that when I think about it, it still gives me goosebumps. That's all for this video. Thank you for making all the way through and supporting my stories. Have a wonderful day or night.